Take your Bibles to the book of James tonight. We're back in James, talking about our faith and how we need to grow and have faith and what kind of faith. And uh, we've spent the last several months, I guess, going over different aspects of faith from the book of James. And I don't, we're not quite done yet, won't be done yet this evening, so we'll still have more to learn in the weeks ahead, it looks to me like. Um, and that's good because I don't think I'm quite, I don't think I quite got it enough yet. I need a little bit more faith and I need to understand a little bit better and uh, hopefully express it a little bit more as well. And uh, I trust that, uh, that you need that as well. Maybe that's why the Lord's helping me to uh, share these thoughts with you. But it's good to have you. Again, good to have visitors with us tonight. Be sure to get around and, and uh, meet them and greet them. And uh, we appreciate you guys coming up and visiting with us tonight. James chapter 5 is where we're at. If you found your spot and you have the strength and ability on this Wednesday night to stand, we'll do that as we read verses uh, 7 to 12. 7 to 12 in James chapter 5. <clears throat> The Bible says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it. Long patience for it. Until he receiveth the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Be ye also patient. Maybe you'll see by the time we get done reading this where, where I'm going with this tonight. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Judge, uh, grudge rather not. I get my bifocals focused. Judge, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of the suffering of affliction and of patience, of patience. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Patience. Tonight, our subject, our thought is having a patient faith, a patient and expectant faith, moreover. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your love. Thank you that Jesus is coming. We're so looking forward to it and pray that as we look forward as to it, as we wait and prepare for it, we pray that you'd help us to do so with patience, expecting and looking forward to and anticipating his soon appearing. We ask for your blessing and your help for each and every one of us tonight. We pray that you'd intercede in our hearts and our thoughts, helping us to set aside our distractions and troubles of life and focus momentarily on your word and what you have for us, each and every one tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Patient. That word appears four times in these six short verses. And the two verses that don't have the word patient certainly refer to it and give us instruction and help with it. So uh, this passage really is about having patient faith. Having faith that Jesus, yes, he's coming. And he's, he's, not, he's not delaying on purpose, but we're not ready and he's not ready. He's giving us another day, another opportunity, another hour perhaps to prepare ourselves to learn to trust in him and to trust him more and more perfectly and more fully. And we're reminded of a number of things here in the passage that I want to point out to you tonight. But this word, let's start with the word. I like definitions. I think they're important because I think a lot of times... It's not that God changed what he thought. His thoughts were still the same as they ever were, and, and certainly as the same as they were when he recorded this. But our understanding of the words that were used has changed. We don't understand things the same way that they were recorded. And we certainly, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. So we need a little help, all the help we can get. 
So definitions are part of that help. Patient, long-spirited, forbearing, long-suffering, all synonyms and similar ideas to this word patient. In other words, uh, we need to wait on the Lord. We need to be patient for Him. We need to be long-spirited. That is, uh, we understand that this is not uh, a, a, a quick race. This is not uh, a short deal. This is, this is a long-term investment that we're making. My faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I hope he does come tomorrow, but I've been hoping that for the last 32 years, ever since I knew about it. And, uh, you know, I've been anticipating it. I've been preparing for it. I've been studying. I still study. I still read every day. I still want to uh, think about that and, and prepare myself for that coming. And I think about this. You know, every day that he gives me here on this earth, I have two objectives. One, to make myself more prepared for his appearing and more opportunities to encourage other people to be prepared as well. Those are my two objectives in life. Everything else is a bonus. I don't know if it's icing. Sometimes it's honey uh, running over the top. But whatever the case, God is good. And those are our two primary goals, to learn more and prepare more for his coming and then to help others also. So let me give you a couple of thoughts about this passage uh, this evening. First of all, I want you to see the reason for our patience, the reason we're supposed to be patient, the reason he's encouraging us to be patient. Hey, the coming of the Lord. Verses 7 and 8 uh, in our passage tonight says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. We need to be patient because he is coming. And I realize it's been said for 2,000 years now. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And there are people who say, well, if he was coming, he would already came. Or maybe he's not coming at all. But no, he is coming. And we need to be patient for that coming. We need to anticipate it. There's a good reason to be patient because there's something good ahead. It's like when we tell our kids, if you work hard in the garden, if you, if you work hard in the blackberries. My, my parents made a deal with their kids years ago uh, when we moved back here. Uh, you, you come and pick the blackberries. You get to pick while you eat, or you get to eat while you pick, rather. Sometimes it's eat while you pick, but sometimes it's pick while you eat. It depends on how much ends up in the bucket. But at the end of the, end of the picking day, no matter what time of morning it was, the kids got to go back and have an ice cream. Didn't matter if it ruined their lunch or not. That was their, their, their reward for working hard. And, uh, you know, my wife and I continue that tradition on after my dad's passed. But, uh, but the, the point is this. You have to have something to look forward to. I said something about that on Sunday when I was preaching. And uh, I said, you know, if you, if you didn't expect a paycheck at the end of your work week, would you go to work? this week. And, and the unanimous was, no, I think we'd, we'd find somewhere else to show up every day, right? If they weren't going to pay me. You know, God says we can be patient. We should be patient. And here's the, here's the ice cream at the end. Jesus is coming. And we can look forward to the rest of eternity forever and ever and ever in heaven. We don't have to put up with sin. We don't have to even put up with ourselves anymore. Because all, everything that's wrong with me will be corrected. I'm absolutely looking forward to that. Jesus' coming is a good reason for a great many things. But it's an excellent reason to be patient uh, in our lives and in our living and in our walk with the Lord and having uh, faith in Him and confidence in Him. Uh, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, it says. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Yes, it's getting closer. Um, every single day, every hour, it's getting closer. Uh, but he mentions here the husbandman. That's a farmer. Whatever you're planting, maybe it's uh, sweet corn. Anybody like sweet corn? Sweet corn's some good stuff. But you know what? Uh, the wife and kids have been planting the garden. They planted some sweet corn yesterday. I didn't get to eat any for supper tonight. Can you believe it? They didn't cook me any sweet corn. Why is that? Because it hadn't grown yet. It's not even sprouted yet. And, and that's the point. It's not ready. And we have to patiently wait for that. So it's a thing that we get to know. We see this in life. Uh, everybody knows this. You can't, it's not an instance. It is an instance society, isn't it? 
and instant oatmeal and instant mashed potatoes and most things instant aren't all that great. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, the old-fashioned way of preparing it is better. And, uh, but the point is, Jesus is coming, and we need to be patient, just like the farmer's patient, waiting for his crop to grow. He puts it in the ground. He does all the prep work, puts it in the ground, uh, hoes it, weeds it, takes care of it, watches it grow. But have you ever thought, looking up at the sweet corn patch, there's only one thing, one, one uh, being that is more anticipating sweet corn coming to ripe than my family is. Raccoons. And they know exactly when to go check it out. They know exactly when to get that stuff, right? And uh, you know, just thinking about this, you can go up to the patch and you can kind of pull the husk down a little bit and check out the progress. But you know, if you did that to every, every ear of corn, on the, you'd ruin the whole batch, right? So we need to be patient and uh, wait because he is coming. We will eat sweet corn this year uh, unless the raccoons want it more than we do. We will have blackberries this year. Um, I, I, even the deer don't get to eat that many blackberries, so... Praise the Lord for that. Sweet corn, that's where I was at. Whatever the fruit is, watermelon. Plant a bunch of watermelon seeds, it's not quite time yet for that. Mark says it is, I don't know. You plant a bunch of watermelons, but hey, you've got to wait for them to get ripe. You can't go around and bust everyone open, one, this one won't ripe, let me try this one, let me try that one. That doesn't work. You have to be patient. You have to kind of know what, uh, what to look for and, and how to get it. Otherwise, you might break them or break them off the vine, and you never have any of that juicy goodness to eat. It's patience. There needs to be ample rain. The, the Scripture points that out. Uh, you have to wait for the early and the latter rain. The time has to be right. And listen, we're waiting on the Lord, and the time is not right. He came, and he was born in just the right time. And he's going to come again in just the right time. And again, he's left us here for a reason, to prepare ourselves and to help other people get ready. That's what we're here for. So that's what we need to focus on. I know it's very interesting at times to study prophecy. It's an interesting subject. But you know what's more important than prophecy? Prophecy. Studying to be prepared for his coming. Because you're never going to figure out when he's coming. The best you can do is prepared when he does come. So we should be studying to be prepared. We should be growing our faith to be prepared for his coming. That's what we need to be working on. And once he does come, the rest of eternity... What will we be doing? I don't know, but we'll be enjoying his presence and we'll be enjoying his creation and we'll be enjoying it all without sin and without wickedness and without all this uh, strife and tribulation and turmoil. I can't wait. Notice in verse number eight again, he says, Be also patient. Establish your hearts, he says, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Establish your hearts. Remember when Jesus told the parable of the soils? You know, you had... You know, the, 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 the wayside soil and, and the stony ground soil. And then you had the good soil, right? And that good ground produced fruit. Some 60-fold, some 100-fold. But it was fruitful. One of the characteristics of the good ground, in fact, I want you to turn back and look at this, Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter number 8. I want you to see this. Look at verse 15 there. We won't look at that whole parable, but I just want to, to point this one thing out to you. We're talking about being fruitful and waiting for the fruit and to uh, ripen and be prepared and be ready. But even in that parable of the soils, the good soil, notice what had to happen there. But on that but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, which is what the soil was about, the good heart, 
having heard the word, keep it. That's steadfast in heart. They were steadfast. They kept it. And notice this. Bring forth fruit with, with what? Patience. Right? Jesus is coming. And his coming is closer today than it's ever been before. Uh, and tomorrow will be even closer. And will he come tomorrow? I don't know. I hope so. But if not, my goal will be to prepare. Prepare myself and help to prepare others. So let's go back to our text. Let me give you a second thought from the next section here. He says, take my brethren, verse, uh, verse 10. Look at verse 10. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction. For an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Notice that, it, you know, if, if you were eating uh, sweet corn every day. It would be easy to be patient, wouldn't it? Because my plate's full of sweet corn. I, I'm not, I don't have to, I, I'm not sitting around twiddling my thumbs, I'm not sitting around fretting, when am I going to have sweet corn? I've got it. When is it the most, when is the most anxiety about waiting for something? When you don't have it, when you're hungry for it. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for the Lord to come. I want him to come. This passage tells us that these prophets, and so the, the point is he's saying, look back at the prophets. They spoke in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. They had patience when it wasn't easy, when it was hard, when things were difficult, when they were being abused, when they were being neglected, when they were being rejected, when nobody wanted to pay attention to them. They were patient. And he said, that's our example. The prophets are our example. I want to point out to you a passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 2 Chronicles 36. We're going to look at a couple of examples here that the Bible has for us. 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and look at verse, verses 15 and 16. Get my Bible to cooperate with me. 36, 2 Chronicles 36, verses 15 and 16. You know, it's not always going to be easy for us, especially if we're desiring to serve the Lord. If you're anticipating the Lord's return, and you're looking forward to that, and you're trying to prepare yourself, and you're trying to be an encouragement and help to others, then like the prophets, you're probably going to suffer some affliction. You're going to get some feedback, and it's going to be negative feedback, I, I, uh, I can assure you, because of our faith in the Lord. Verses uh, 15 and 16 of Second uh, Chronicles 36. Notice what he says here. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose up against his people, rose, arose against his people, and there, uh, till there was no remedy. Here's my point. Here's why I want to bring this in. These prophets that James is referring back to, he said, we need to look back at them for patience in affliction and understanding that we're here as the church. We're here in the New Testament. We're here in this time waiting for the Lord's return, and we have a job to do, and it's not made easy by the fact that they're rejecting. We knock on doors here in Perryville, and sometimes people don't want to open. Sometimes they open, and we wish they hadn't opened. Be thankful that our affliction isn't near what their affliction was, first of all. Second of all, this is, this is the pattern that God has had from the garden. He told Noah, preach. And for a hundred years while he's preparing the ark, he's preaching. How many people got in the ark? Eight. And they were his family. 
Can you imagine the conversation on the ark? Sitting around the dinner table in the evening? Now, I don't know if they made a big table or not. It'd be pure speculation. But I'm thinking, the ark was prepared for thousands. It was big enough for multitudes to get on that thing. But eight people got on. Can you imagine, think about the conversation around the great big table that's been set and made. It was all made out of wood and all prepared before the door was closed. Hey, Dad. I know you trusted God, and I know God gave you the, all the dimensions and everything, but why did we build this thing so big? We could have built this in a quarter of the time if we'd have just made it big enough for eight people and the animals. We didn't need a basketball court. We didn't need, we didn't need a handball court. We didn't need a, a baseball diamond. We didn't need any of this room. But we're patiently waiting, preparing, encouraging, obeying, anticipating what God's going to do and wants to do. And so we look back at the prophets and realize, okay, what we do in trying to help not only prepare ourselves, but help other people, it's not always well received, but this isn't a new gig. This isn't a new thing. This isn't a new way. This, this has been going this way for a long time. And just know this, God, as, as it is here in the scriptures, we see God's not going to be mocked. They might mock us, but God will not be mocked. They will stand before him in judgment. And they will not have an excuse. So we can be patient in continuing to serve God, even if nobody responds, even if nobody wants to hear, even if they're rejecting the truth. We think about the prophets. Another one that was mentioned in, the, in this passage that we're studying, that we're looking at, James chapter 5, is the man named Job. You're not far from there. Turn to the right just a little bit, and you can find Job over there. I want to point out just a couple quick passages until we get back to our James chapter 5. Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. Just point out verse 10 here real quick. Job chapter 2, verse number 10. Most of you know the story of Job. I'm not going to spend any time going back over it. Verse 10 in chapter 2 is where Job's wife, this is the second round, Job's wife is now uh, kind of upset about how things are going here. I can't blame her a bit. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, he asked, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, notice, did not Job sin with his lips? That's important as we get to the end of this message, but the point that I want to make here is, even when you don't have agreement, even when there's frustration, even when it, things are not going well, it's difficult, it's, it's trials and tribulations to follow the Lord and obey the Lord and trust the Lord and increase our faith and, and confidence in Him, and it's going to be all right, and we're doing what He said, and it doesn't always feel good, and it isn't always reassuring. The, the environment isn't always reassuring you. That's where you need a close walk with the Lord to know that you're on track, that you're doing right by God. So Job, look at Job chapter 13, and let's just advance a little bit in this section and look a little further down the road and see what's happening here. Job chapter 13, verses 15 and 16 here. Job 13, verses 15 and 16. He says here, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. I won't give up. I'm being steadfast in heart, as our text pointed out. He also, verse 16, shall be my salvation. What is that? That's faith. That's confidence. That's hope. That's anticipation. For an hypocrite shall not come before him. You know what he 
Job points out here that a person who is wavering in their faith is a hypocrite before God. I don't want to be a hypocrite before God. That's two-faced. That's somebody who's presenting one way and is actually another way inside. Someone with a mask is the, is the definition of hypocrite. Jump over to chapter 41 and notice the end of the story and we'll move on. Job chapter 41, notice verses, uh, start in verse 10 there and we'll read a few verses here in this section. Job chapter 41, <clears throat> starting in verse number 10, this is the end of uh, nearing the end of the story of Job and what's happened in his life. And it says, None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Uh, who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Obviously, this is God speaking. It will not conceal his, uh, I rather, will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Who can come, who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? Who can open the doors of his face? Uh, his teeth are terrible round about. His scales, his pride shut up together as uh, with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. This is not the passage that I was thinking I was reading. Job 41, 10 to, it's probably 42, my big old finger. No, no, no. Yes, yes, look at the end. Look at the end. That's exactly what I did. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends, as also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now think back for a moment to verse 10. When Job was, was challenging his wife, he, she challenged him. He said, no, God's going to do what God's going to do. And then we jumped into chapter 13. He said, I'm going to trust him. I'm going to follow him. It's not easy, but I'm going to do it. Verse 11 in, in uh, Job chapter 42 here. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him all, over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord, notice this, so the Lord what? Blessed the latter end of Job. More, that's a good word to circle, more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep. That's a whole bunch, by the way. 6,000 camels, I can't even imagine. And 1,000 yoke of oxen. That's, that's 2,000 oxen at least. 1,000 she-asses. He uh, had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third, Karin, I'm not even going to try. And in all the land, there were no women so, uh, found so fair as the daughters of Job. Think about this. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. Uh, after this lived Job in 140 years, and he saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died, being old and full of days. How, how thankful do you think Job was? at the end, that he stayed faithful through all the troubles. <clears throat> Quitters aren't winners, by the way. Winners aren't quitters. It's not always going to be easy, but we need to be patient, and we need to endure, and we know it's not going to be easy, but God, God will bless if we'll be patient because, hey, the hope, the expectation, the future is we're going to spend eternity with Jesus. He promised so. He's coming for us. He's prepared a place for us. Let's look at another example on our way back to our text. Stop in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 22, and look at verse 63, and right away you'll see the example 
our text is telling us to look back, to look around, to look at others, to look how they've handled it, to look what's happened in their life as an example of how we should continue to encourage us that, hey, listen, Jesus is coming. It's going to be all right. We can do this. We can get through this. Luke chapter 22, verse 63 to 65. 63 to 65. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. Did you know that Jesus never, he could have told them exactly who did it. He could have said, well, let's tell you what, the guy that hit me will be dead right now. And he just fell down flat. He could have responded. He could have talked back. He could have, but he didn't. He patiently endured. He knew the end. He had confidence in the end. He had put his life in the Father's hand. He was being obedient to God. That's exactly what we need to do. This is a patient and enduring faith. That's what I'm preaching about. That's what the prophets did. That's what Job did. That's what Jesus did. That's what we need to do. Look at another passage. Back up just a little bit before we go to our text. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and see what Jesus said to us. See his encouragement to us in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 11. And then we'll move to a third point and we'll round it out. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Notice he says, blessed are ye. Blessed means happy by definition. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. That doesn't sound very happy, does it? And persecute you. I'm definitely not liking it. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. None of that sounds very blessed, does it? Verse 12 says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward. When? Where? In heaven. When's our expectation? What is our expectation? What do we have to look forward to? He didn't say great is your reward here and now. He said great is your reward in heaven. We can be thankful because he is preparing for us and he promised us he's coming back for us and he said there's something going to happen in the future. All of those labors, all of those efforts, all of that turmoil, all of that trouble will be paid in full. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We need to have faith. We need to have confidence. We need to be steadfast of heart, knowing that, hey, God has got this, and it's going to be okay. It's, it may not be easy. In fact, mark it down. It won't be easy. He told us it wouldn't be easy. Aren't we humans funny? He told Peter. He told James. He told all those guys, I'm going to die. They're going to take my life. None of them believed him. Then they didn't believe it when he showed back up. I think they were from Missouri. They might have even been from Perryville. Obviously they weren't. I'm just saying that to correlate and help us understand that, hey, we can trust him. Our plight isn't any different than anyone else's, is or was or ever has been. Great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Back to our text, James chapter 5, please. James chapter 5, we're talking about a faith, a patient faith, an expectant faith. And that's how we need to live out our lives. That's how we need to be. And sometimes, sometimes we're going to be like Job's wife going, is it really worth it? <laughs> but be like Job in the following 
in, in the following section there. Yep, it is. God's going to take, God's going to give, and uh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Doesn't matter. God's, God's got this, and we're going to trust him. We're going to keep watching. We're going to keep marching. We're going to keep moving forward. Now I want you to notice a, a final thought this evening. The results of our patience. All right, I'm not talking about heaven right now. I'm talking about in our lives right now. If we learn a patient and expectant faith, if our faith is patient and if we're expecting Jesus to come and if we get a hold of this, how will we be? How can we assess whether we've gotten this or not? It's the application section. Look at verse 9. He says, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, a judge standeth before the door. The judge standeth before the door. Have you ever seen the look on a child's face? When they're doing wrong, maybe they're in their room fussing and fighting. Maybe they're, they're, you know, they're in there just being kids. And all of a sudden they realize mom or dad's standing by the door. That's kind of the idea that he's pointing out to us right there. The judge is standing right there. It's like I was saying the other day. You know, sometimes we, we get carried on. Sometimes people behave a certain way when the pastor's in the room. But as soon as the pastor comes in the room, he's here. You don't have to be fearful of me. <laughs> I'm not your judge. And your judge is already standing right next to you hearing every idle word that you're saying. That thought ought to put a little fear and trepidation in us. But I'm just a man like you. I struggle the same way you do. In fact, I've heard, of, I've heard tell of a guy... And, and, and I heard this story a while back, and it wasn't here, and it wasn't around here. So n n just so you know, none of the guys are implicated in this room by default, all right? I'm clean slate here. just want you to know, if this happens to apply to you, I'm not telling the story about you, all right? I'll just get a disclaimer right out there right now in case anybody wants to come back and complain later. You was talking about me, weren't you? Mm-mm. I don't know whether none of your wives have come and told me this story. It's not, that's not, I, I got this story a long time ago from another, from another person. Heard of a guy Sunday morning. He'd get himself ready for church and he'd go out and sit in the car, driver's seat. <laughs> Roll down the window. Hurry up! We're going to be late! What's taking you so long anyway? Every couple minutes, he'd lay on the horn. By the time she got to the car, he was done frustrated and upset because he didn't have no patience. All the while, she's inside trying to clean up his breakfast dishes. Make sure her kids are dressed and ready to go. Getting his lunch in the crock pot so when he gets back to the house, it's good and hot and ready to eat. And in between all that, she's trying to get herself ready for church. And he's sitting out in the car. <laughs> What's taking you so long? Again, I, the story was not told here. But I wonder if Jesus came back right between some of those honks, what he'd say about that situation. What's all the whispering about? Again, if, if, if the shoe fits, you got to put it on, but I, I, I'm just relaying a story from somewhere else, all right? But I believe if we lived each and every moment of our life with the realization that Jesus could come back in that heartbeat, I just happen to think we might be a little kinder to the people around us, a little more patient toward them. 
All right. Again, just so you know, I am not saying I'm perfect in this. I am certainly not. You could ask my wife. She probably, she's so nice she wouldn't tell you. My kids, you might get it out of them a little bit. Yeah, you heard it. You know which one to go to. <laughs> Grudge not, it says, one against another. Lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. You know, another thing that I see in this passage about the, the, the judge being at the door and about us, uh, our patient faith will, will affect us. How will that work? What does that look like? Verse 12 tells us a little bit. He says, but above all things, my brethren. That means this is important and it's, you know, he states it's above all things. You know, this is one of the ways we can see whether we're patiently enduring, or whether we're patiently anticipating his return, whether we're thinking about it, whether it's on our hearts and our minds. He says, above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea and your nay, nay lest you fall into condemnation. Mm. I think what he's trying to tell us is that if we have a patient and enduring faith, it will change what comes out of our mouth. How we treat others, how we talk to others, how we Consider our words before we let them roll off our tongue, knowing that Jesus is hearing all of them, then he's going to hear us, and, and he's going to know what we're saying, and, and he's gonna give, we're going to have to give an account for that. Lest you fall into condemnation. And that word's never a good word. Never has good ending, Right? You know, somebody says, well, I'm saved, preacher. I don't have to worry about any of that. Well, listen, I'm not sure. I'm not so sure that some of us, the first words out of Jesus' mouth is not going to be well done. It might be bend over. Did you realize that there is a point in the book of Revelation in which he wipes away the tears? I wonder why he's going to wipe away our tears. I'm in heaven after all. It might be because I got the best whooping of my entire eternal life right there. And now he's wiping away the tears saying, okay, let's, let's go on and let's, let's be better, right? Mm. I, just saying. But I don't know if you've noticed this, but certainly today's young generations have a a, a, a verbiage and a, and a speech impediment beyond any generation prior to this, in my opinion. And I, you know, just saying, I've seen some very young people, heard rather, some very young people using some very colorful language. And I don't think it's good. And I don't know if they learned it from their parents or their grandparents or from their schoolmates or their neighbors or where they learned it from. But all I'm saying is, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are patiently enduring, anticipating his return, if your faith is such that you are looking forward to his coming, it ought to control your mouth, your tongue, your words. And understand that our words, and I'm not going to preach this, it, it, I'm not going to go much further in it anyway, our words come from our hearts. So if that filth is coming out of your mouth, guess what? It came directly from here, the Bible says. And that's a bad in indication, right? Have you ever gone to the fridge because there was some leftovers in there that you really wanted to get a hold of? And when you grabbed that container out and you set it on the counter and you popped the lid, you went, oh, that's not good. 
Apparently you've done that. I was working on a customer's house. I used to do construction. I worked on a customer's house one time, and old lady, she said, uh, Mr. Kiefer, can you do me a favor? I'm, I'm not sure, but I think my freezer broke. Oh. I don't know how we're going to get that out of this basement with that opening again, but I'm going to do everything I can do to try. I wonder if that's how God smells our words sometimes. We open our mouth, and it's like opening that container. And I realize today's society, it's such a, it, it's just the way it is, preacher. I mean, that's just the way everybody talks. I mean, let's get over it. I can get over it. But friends, what I read in the Bible is God's not getting over it. He's never liked it, still doesn't like it, never gonna like it. And it's a symptom. The real concern is that vileness in our language, derogatory, dirty, filthy, it's a, it's a symptom of a bigger problem right here. Did y'all hear that? It just felt deathly quiet in here. I said, preacher, I didn't come here to be made feel bad. I didn't come here to make you feel bad. I just came here to point out what I see in the scriptures. By the way, until you know you're wrong, you can't make it right, can you? And what would be coming to church if we didn't figure out something that was wrong and make it right? Wouldn't it be best if we figured that out? If your car is broke, you take it to the shop hoping they're going to figure out what's wrong, right? You never like what's wrong. You never like paying for what's wrong. But you always like it when you get it back fixed. You go to the doctor and say, he gave me bad news, preacher. Bad news. Well, yeah, but bad news is really good news, isn't it? Because it means they figured out what was wrong. When you went in there, you didn't have a clue what was wrong other than you don't feel no good. Now he, he told you what it was. And hopefully he knows how to fix it or knows at least what needs to be done to fix it, right? They didn't like the prophets when they told them the truth either. They didn't like Jesus when he told them the truth. Job's friends didn't like him. His wife didn't care for what he had to say and what he was doing. Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to close here. I, Matthew chapter 12. Listen, if you came here for me to stroke your ego, you now realize I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. Why? Because Jesus might come back tomorrow. And if you have to stand before him and give an account for those words that you were saying, and I didn't challenge you on that tonight, I'm going to be in trouble too. Friend, you want to be in trouble, that's, that's on you, but don't, no. Mm -mm. Don't drag me down with you. <laughs> Say, why are you laughing? Well, not because I'm humored, but because I'm thankful that God has helped me to be truthful with you, and I have great hope and anticipation and expectation that by telling somebody the truth, they might change. Right? I went to the spine doctor the, last week. VA took pictures. They said, you've got problems. We're going to send you to the specialist. I said, okay. Specialist is the place I need to go, right? Went through all the... Sit down in this... Wait. Yep, I'll sit here and wait. Finally, they... Guy came in the room. He goes, well, I've looked at your stuff. Uh-huh. He goes, I know what the problem is, or at least I know, you know. He goes, 
the good news is you, I don't recommend surgery. That's the good news. The bad news is you probably need some therapy because you've been looking down too much. Your computer screen, your, your honeybees, you're always looking down like this. And your neck needs to be more back like this. He goes, we fix this, you're probably going to feel a lot better. Sign me up. Right? Tell me the truth. Just t tell me the way it is. Because lying to me ain't going to help. You know, he, he could have gotten thousands of dollars stuffed in his pocket if he said, yeah, let's just go in here and cut on that. I'm so thankful he didn't lie to me. He didn't sugarcoat it. He said, here's the problem. Here's how to fix it. Let's go. Yes, sir. Matthew chapter 12, did you find it? Remember, if, you, if the answer is yes, amen is, is the way. You found it? All right, look at verse 36 and 37, and we're, we'll be done. We'll be done. 36 and 37, Matthew chapter 12, the Bible says, But I say unto you that most idle words that men shall speak. That's not what your, word, your Bible says. That's not what mine says either. It says, every idle word that men shall speak, I might know about it, and I might hold them accountable to it on the day of judgment. No, that's not what it says either. Man, y'all are good at correcting me tonight. I hope you take it just as well from me. They shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Listen. We start pouring, well, everybody else is saying it, everybody else is doing it. Young people don't say things because everybody else is saying them. For by thy words, verse 37, by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned, it says. Say, I'm, but I'm saved. Yeah. And you might hear bend over anyway. Praise the Lord, you won't hear depart from me if you're saved, but you might hear bend over. I got some, I have somewhat to say unto thee, just like he told Simon Peter. I have somewhat to say unto thee. Okay, let's have it. Aren't you thankful that God gives us time to prepare for his coming? And that's what we're doing here tonight. We're preparing for his coming. We're hearing, yeah, we're hearing some encouragement, right? We can do this. Let's go. Let's do this. We can, let's be faithful unto the end. Let's, let's charge forward. Let's, but listen, let's charge forward correctly, rightly, holily, sanctified and set apart unto the Lord. By the way, that's, Sunday school hour, that's what we've been studying, holiness. I, just, I think I just figured out why Sunday school attendance has dipped a little bit. Hmm. I have to pray about that. I don't think I'm done. Did you notice that they didn't... God sent the prophets to the people, and the people didn't want to listen. Did you notice that? I sense that may still be a problem. That may still be a problem. Please understand. Please understand me tonight. I am not coming to you from the perspective of per perfectness. The, I am not perfect. I just told somebody before the service, I am not perfect. I am far from perfect. I have to challenge myself on these very things every single day. I was a sailor at one time, remember? I've been a sinner my whole life. Now I'm just a sinner saved by grace and trying to live the way I'm supposed to live until he comes. And I'd love for you to come along on this journey and this ride with me so that when he comes, we're like him, as like him as we possibly can be, and we're ready for him. 
I don't want you to hear bend over any more than I want to hear bend over. I don't want you, I don't want you to hear depart from me either, by the way. If you're not saved, we need to get that settled. Let's talk about that. Listen, if you're a Christian, you're a believer, and you're not living right, well, why? There's an altar here. There's a, a place here. There is a, a people here. For your encouragement, for your help. Not to judge you. Not to judge you. Please understand, I'm not your judge. And no man here, no woman here is your judge. And what I preach from this pulpit... The very best of my ability is what I find in this book that he wants me to challenge you with so that you can be ready if he comes back tomorrow. You might have you just used some potty language before you got here tonight. You know the good news about that? You can be forgiven before you leave here tonight. Isn't that a blessing? You, you may have come here on your way to hell, and you could leave here on your way to heaven. You could have come here with no faith, hardly whatsoever, and you could leave here full of faith if you'll just surrender and submit to the Lord. If you'll yield yourself and turn yourself over to Him, He'll accept you and forgive you and change you and help you. Isn't that a blessing? It's a blessing to me. Let's stand together tonight. Let's stand together. Let's have an invitation. Because I may have, with God's help, said something that you need to talk with the Lord about tonight. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that during this invitation. The altar will be open. As soon as you hear the piano playing, you can come here and pray. You can pray at your seat if that's what you want to do. But if God's spoken to your heart, I found the altar is the most helpful place. If you need counsel, I'll get you some. We'll sit down together and we'll talk together and pray together. Whatever the case is, my challenge to you tonight is submit to God. Surrender and yield to him. And let him do what he wants to do and needs to do in your life to help you be right for when he comes back. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for meeting with us tonight. Father, I pray that you'd help us even now during this invitation. That we might assess ourselves of what we've heard tonight. Where we're at in our faith. In our walk with you. How we're doing in our life. And how that faith is. How we can evaluate that by the words that we say. And how we live and conduct ourselves. Whether we're impatient with people or not. I pray that you'd help us to evaluate accurately. And might your Holy Spirit work in our hearts and in our midst to accomplish your will and desire and goal so that you receive all the glory and honor and praise. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.